I am pleased to welcome all of you to our second Lunch and Learn session, our second of the new session. Uh, Ariel Grumberg, a long-term member of our congregation, is going to be speaking about the Jewish National Fund. It ain't just trees. Ariel has lots and lots of experience working with JNF and other projects in Israel, and he's going to share some of that with us. I ask if you have any questions that you wait until the end, Ariel will be happy to answer them at that point. Mm -hmm. But at this point, if everybody can mute themselves and then Ariel will start. Okay, I'm taking it All away. Right. Okay, so Jewish National Fund, it ain't just trees. Thank you, Rabbi Resnick. Keith Harrow and the Hewlett East Rockaway Jewish Center for giving me this opportunity to talk about Jewish National Fund. It is my favorite nonprofit organization. Jane F. gives me the opportunity to get more involved in what I am passionate about, which is supporting the land and people of Israel. For me, Israel is not just my birthplace, not just where my parents met and started to raise a family, but where all Jews came from thousands of years ago. It is the home of the Jewish people. I believe that if we are to survive as an ethnic religious group and be able to practice our culture freely, we must have our own country. We've been persecuted since our first temple was destroyed in 587 BC. And programs started in different countries all over the world throughout the centuries. Should anti-Semitism continue to grow in Europe and in the USA, turn it off. We must have a safe and secure place to go. That is why I believe we must support the development of the state of Israel. There is no other organization that raises money here to be spent almost exclusively in Israel for the betterment of all citizens of Israel. Let me explain how it's done. A little background is needed. 90% of Israel's population is concentrated in an area around Haifa, Tel Aviv, and Jerusalem. The rest of the country is largely uninhabited. The area has little population, is 70% of the country. In order to more evenly distribute the population around the country, JNF came up with a strategy to develop the Galilee, which currently makes up 17% of Israel's landmass, and the Negev Desert which makes up 60% of Israel's landmass. Our goal is to attract 300,000 people, new residents in the Galilee, which is the Northern part of Israel, and 500,000 new residents in the Negev, which is the Southern part of Israel. You may ask, how can we do this? Well, by focusing on housing, employment, tourism, infrastructure, medical facilities, and private investments. These are the six project areas that JNF is involved in. As you can see, it's not just trees. We have community building, disabilities, education. I'll go into each one of these uh, a little more in depth as we, as we continue. We have built the new communities that never existed in the Negev <clears throat> and supported others where young people were not staying in their communities after mandatory military service. One of the many communities building, building efforts was working with our partner, Makom. Makom is the largest national organization in Israel that brings together individuals and groups from all sectors of society to share knowledge, collaborative, collaborative on, on initiatives, create dialogue amongst diverse populations, and work together to promote society as a whole. Today, there are over 200 Makom communities representing all sectors of Israeli society, including young educators, Ethiopians, artists, Druze, Haredi, and other religious and secular pluralistic communities. Now, the, the, the tall gentleman you see on, that, uh, on, that, on this slide is, a, is Druze. He's a Druze. And he operates in the northern part of Israel, almost near the border with, um, with Lebanon. <clears throat> a very big Druze community. And over in the middle, middle left, 
is a, um, an Ethiopian woman who is uh, working uh, also with the Ethiopian community and, um, and they educate them to be um, more appreciative of their background and heredity, hereditary, heredity, and to uh, realize that um, they're important and to have good self-image. Uh, we met them for almost three hours one day when I was with uh, a McCor group, which is uh, part of the JNF Speakers Bureau. And uh, we got to really meet many of the group leaders uh, from Macomb communities from around the country. And they were very, very interesting. Um, so as part of our as part of our focus on improving the quality of life in Israel for everyone, Jewish National Fund ensures that no member of Israeli society is left behind. The fact that nearly 13% of citizens are considered physically and mentally challenged is an opportunity for us to live our values. We support our partners in Ali Nega Nahalot, Iran, a state-of-the-art rehabilitative facility that supports 140 permanent residents who have physical and emotional disabilities. We also support, well, before I go into the next one, I've been to this facility at least six times and I can never come out of there without feeling overwhelmed with emotion. It is an amazing place. Um, you may have two or three people, volunteers taking care of one resident there. They are so handicapped, they can't dress themselves uh, many of them have never spoken. They've had tremendous, they have tremendous physical and emotional difficulties. If they weren't here, they would not survive one day at home or anywhere else. It's an amazing place uh, and such dedication of the people there. We also support our partner Red Mountain Therapeutic Writing Center where young people with special needs have therapeutic writing sessions. I've been there also a few times. I've even ridden their horses. Uh, it's a phenomenal place. Usually they only let the, hand, the people who need therapy use their horses, but we as, uh, as, as part of McCor are supposed to be able to speak about it. So I said, I gotta get on a horse. Otherwise I can't talk about it. So that was that. So the Red Mountain Therapy, this is where young people with special needs have therapeutic writing sessions. And another program JNF supports is Special in Uniform, um, where 300 special needs young adults enter the IDF and serve their country in whatever way they can. For example, autistic people are much better at deciphering raw data on a screen. They have a better attention span to details. By integrating special needs young adults into the national service, they feel that they are contributing to society and everyone benefits. And I've been there for many graduating sessions as well. And it's amazing and it's very, very touching to see these special needs kids being graduated and, and getting so emotional and happy. And their parents are so excited to see these kids graduating from, from the military. I mean, who would have thought that it could even get into the military at one time, but because of the JNF program, they really can, can thrive. It makes the families really happy. The, the uh, young adults feel they're contributing to society because Israel, everyone has to, everyone has to be in the uh, service. So it's, it's really very, very uh, good. At LOTEM, our partner makes the great outdoor accessible. Over 35,000 people are spent annually in their forests, parks, picnic areas, playgrounds, nature trails, lookout, and recreational facilities. Someone's not muted, I think. And, and we hear a lot of background noise. <laughs> no. I don't know if they're scraping uh, gravel or what. <laughs> okay. Um, See, the red ones are muted. Never mind. Can someone mute themselves? All of these programs are geared to support the periphery of the country 
as part of our strategic goal to make it more attractive to move to the Galilee and the Negev. At the Aravai International Center for Agricultural Training, also known as ACAT, Jewish National Fund imparts professional agricultural knowledge and skills to students from developing countries, some of which have no diplomatic relations with Israel. While establishing itself as a national and international leading authority in sophisticated arid lands agricultural studies and training. This not only provides an invaluable contribution to developing countries and their students who attend, but also provides additional high quality employment for the local residents. The staff of 80 lecturers and facilitators is comprised of resident, residents of the Arava and a part of their studies, the ACAT students work on local farms. Additionally, throughout the year, the participant students take part in regional agricultural activities and visit various farms in the Arava, as well as other tourist sites throughout Israel. Each year, more than 1,000 students complete the training course and become willing ambassadors for Israel, spreading JNF's positively Israel message. I've also attended uh, the um, ACAT. I've been there for uh, about half a day with other members of uh, our McCord mm -hmm. group. And we got to speak to some of the students. One of them came from Jordan and uh, he was asked, uh, what did your parents think about you coming to Israel? This is before, uh, it's about six months ago, more than that, just before the pandemic. And he says, well, they were a little apprehensive. You know, uh, what, what people in Jordan know about Israel is not a, on a positive uh, level. So uh, they were a little concerned, but once he was there, he was, he loved it. He had a great, he was having a great time. And, uh, and these people do become ambassadors for Israel. The Israeli Education and Technology Campus will have one, an internship innovation and technology center for college graduates and postgrads who seek to internship experience abroad with world renowned high tech companies near the campus for one year or more. Two, it'll have a Zionist education center for Jews from around the world to come and learn and connect, including an Israel 101 adult program and an Israel Studies Teachers Institute. Three, it'll also have the new Southern campus of the Alexander Musk High School in Israel, will accommodate a growing global high school student population at the premier college prep study abroad program in the world that has educated more than 28,000 teenagers since 1972. And fourth, it'll have a high quality conference center facilities, as well as comfortable modern accommodations for programs and short and long-term stays. Facilities will include all technology needed for seminars and webinars and is the ideal setting for international events. This is not yet built, we're working on it. It's a huge project. And the, um, the land was provided by the city of Sturot, I mean, I'm sorry, the city of Beersheba. We work very closely with the mayor and he gave us the land in which to build this huge campus. Uh, it'll be amazing when it's finished. Um, I wasn't going to say it, but it's a $300 million project. It's immense. <laughs> um, the Ge Jewish National Fund is developing also the Upper Galilee, uh, Upper Eastern Galilee, a region rife with unemployment, but teeming with potential, with potential. Known as the food basket of Israel, the area provides agricultural products for much of the country as well as fine spices, food, and wine. The region boasts beautiful towns and a mix of cultures, historical sites, and natural wonders that form the foundation for the area to become the food and culinary capital of Israel. At the core of Jewish National Fund's vision for the Upper Eastern Galilee is a Kiryat Shmona and the surrounding region becoming a hub for food business including technology, business management, cooking, restaurants, food and agricultural research and development, hospitality and hotels. This will accomplish through the Galilee Culinary Institute by Jewish National Fund in conjunction 
with the Beit Asher Food Innovation Center. The region is also ripe for investments, including major contributions from industrial players such as Our Crowd, Tnuva, Tempo, and many others. So Jewish National Fund is as a strategy does something to attract populations. And being that it's near uh, where much of the food source comes from in Israel, they decided to build this Galilee Culinary Institute. It will draw uh, foodies from all over the world. It'll have a tremendous uh, school, which will um, train uh, future chefs and uh, it'll be great for the area. It'll really uh, bring people to the area and will make it a great destination for tourists. Jewish National Fund works to raise public awareness of historic sites, restore and preserve them, and develop and operate visitor centers throughout Israel, thus increasing visitations and elevating the importance of Israel's history to the residents and tourists alike. This is achieved through the Society for Preservation of Israeli Heritage Sites. Uh, we, it's abbreviated SPIHS. Uh, an independent nonprofit organization established in 1984 that works to locate, restore, and preserve heritage sites across Israel. It oversees more than 180 heritage sites around the country. Run, now, JNF runs 10 of these sites directly, such as Ammunition Hill Museum, which is the uh, 67 battle for the reunification of Jerusalem. And, um, I've been there at least four times. The Ayalon Institute, which is uh, where bullets were manufactured in British mandate period underground at the kibbutz and very, very close to a, um, a British uh, camp. So this was being built right under the noses of the British who would have immediately arrested everyone involved in this uh, had they known about it. But it was, it's, you've got to go there if you ever go to Israel. It's an amazing um, tour of, of the facility and how they, how they were able to get the raw materials to build the, the, uh, the bullets even and the machinery that they had to bring in uh, and, and, and how they kept it secret from, from everyone in the kibbutz. Nobody in the kibbutz even knew that they were building this thing underneath the ground. Very few people, only the workers knew about it um, so it's a very interesting site. Um, uh, okay, now we're going to talk about the athlete detention camp, which is another one of their uh, uh, historic sites that JNF runs. It's a British mandate site that housed clandestine Jewish immigrants to Palestine after World War II. Millions of visitors come to the different sites each year, learning about Israel's pathway to independence. In this picture, what you see is the athlete detention camp. I've been there also about three or four times and uh, every year they keep adding new exhibits. It's phenomenal what they've done. Uh, unfortunately, in this picture, you don't see much of the, of the site, but then that's a teaser for you to go there yourself and see for yourself what they have. Jewish National Fund supports research that helps solve Israel's water, agricultural, medical, and energy challenges. The positive impact of scientific research is felt across the globe as Israel shares knowledge and advancements with the world. Each initiative and partnership also have a significant impact on local communities, which benefit from the employment and services that come along with the growth of scientific institutions in often remote regions of the Negev. Mangoes, apricots, and berries now grow in Israel thanks to the research at the Aravai Institute. Halusa farmers invented the technique for growing organic carrots in open fields. 60% of Israel's fresh vegetable exports come from the desert where only one inch of rainfall falls annually. The volunteer firefighting program consists of a core of volunteers who will be the first line of defense, particularly in the remote communities of Northern and Southern Israel. These communities are often hard for Israel fire and rescue services to reach in time of emergency. 
Currently, 2,000 professional firefighters protect a population of seven and a half million, which is hardly insufficient to properly save lives during peacetime and nearly impossible in times of emergency. The 3,500 volunteer firefighters, both adult and youth, play the critical role of first responders, providing initial relief and essential rescue services until professionals reach the scene. Jewish National Fund will help build small volunteer fire stations in remote communities and outfit the volunteers with essential gear and equipment. Professional firefighters will lead intensive multi-month training programs, including role-playing in life and death scenarios to ensure that the volunteers have the specialized knowledge needed to protect Israel's land and people. The new volunteer hubs will be located in growing communities in regions already supported by Jewish National Fund's community building efforts and will become an integral part of maintaining the quality of life in these areas. Uh, this is so important for, for the periphery where it can take an hour for a professional firefighting coming from the government's uh, firefighters to get to a location. And if it takes an hour to get to a fire, you could be sure there's nothing to be saved after they get there. So it is so important to have a volunteer firefighters. And this is something that uh, JNF is doing. Before I discuss the water solutions, you need to know the problem. As I said before, Israel's 60% desert. Israel has 50% less rain now than in 1948. Israel supplies more than 12 million people up from 600,000 in 1948. That includes 8 million people living in Israel, plus the Palestinian Authority and the Kingdom of Jordan. Beersheba, known as the capital of the Negev, is home to 225,000 residents. Through it runs Nahal Be'er Sheva, which is a river, a muddy trickle of water. Jewish National Fund is transforming what used to be the area's garbage dump into a quality scenic river in the heart of the desert. JNF has succeeded in cleaning up the river and has completed most of the planned five miles of landscape promenade on each shore. Recently completed, a magnificent 23 acre lake taking, taking treated wastewater from Beersheba municipality, purifying it to the highest level. And that's the picture on your left. JNF uses its experience in water rehabilitation to use the city's recycled water and transport it to the lake for boating, bird watching, and other recreational activities for residents and tourists. This project has is, is been undergoing for, I would say, at least six years. Um, it's been, in, been done in stages, and this is what it, uh, it looks like now. Over the years, JNF has built 250 reservoirs across Israel that store recycled and runoff water for both local and regional communities. The recycled water reservoirs are the final stage in a complex process that involves purifying sewage, treating and storing the recycled water in the reservoirs, where it can then be piped out for use in irrigation. JNF continues to maintain the reservoirs Israel needs to sustain its water-rich economy. More than 50% of Israel's agricultural water comes from recycled water stored in the JNF reservoirs. With the recent severe droughts in Israel, there is an imperative needed to build more reservoirs to store additional treated water. The drought is having a significant effect on farmers throughout Israel who are struggling with agricultural production as their national water quotas are cut. Israel needs 80 new water reservoirs to ensure that farmers have the water supply they need to grow crops and to reach the goal of recycling 95% of its water. Currently, Israel recycles 85% of its water. Spain, which is the highest recycler outside of Israel, recycles 17% of their water. And the United States recycles about 5% of their water. So you can see that if they can get to 95%, it's a miracle. 
In addition to the reservoir, JNF has built a Shamir drilling project, which includes three drills, each about a mile deep, and which is located in the Golan Heights. It draws water from a 5,000 year old aquifer and the water recovered from the drilling is used to serve the immense agricultural industry in the north of Israel, including agricultural research and development, irrigation to orchards and fields, and a fish farm, and fish farms, I should say. The water from the Shamir has helped to sustain local agriculture during the past five years of drought. When I joined Long Island Board 10 years ago, we raised money for this Shamir drill. So this is one of my projects that uh, I, every time we go to Israel, and we've been there over 40 times, I was, I want to go see the Shamir drill that JNF uh, Long Island Board helped build. And they said, there's nothing to see, it's just a drill. So I've never seen it. It's one of the projects I, I want to once get to see, even though there might not be anything to really see. Rain harvesting system is another project of JNF. I've been to a school, one of about 70, that participates in this program. Rainwater runoff on the roof of the school is collected into a large plastic holding tanks and pumped into the bathrooms for use to flush toilets, cleaning, and watering fields. This program involves students in the planning, management of the system, from the installation of, and the collection of the monitoring of water savings. They participate in a dynamic educational curriculum that teaches them about Israel's water crisis and the importance of conservation. I remember being in one of the classrooms where we actually got to sit with the students and the teacher was talking about the, uh, the, the program, how the tanks work and, and that the kids have to maintain it and they have to know uh, how it operates. And it's really good. It's great educational experience. And it instills in the students the, the importance of conservation. And even if their parents never got to see this or do this, they go home with the information and they, you know, they, they impart this uh, bit of information to their parents and their siblings. When I mentioned so far, what I mentioned so far is that just a brief overview of what JNF does. It's an organization with the participation of lay leaders in all aspects of the organization and campaigns. There are almost 20 task forces comprised of lay leaders from across the country who work directly with our partners in, and regions on the ground in Israel to determine the needs and set priorities. They then help turn that vision into reality and help meet the fundraising goals. I'm involved in two task forces. The Gaza Envelope Task Force, which raises funds in order to build safe places for people to congregate when not at school. The area of our task forces, of my task force, has 60 miles of border with Gaza and Egypt. And, and the population of this area is, is about 50,000 people. And they live in Kibbutzim, Moshavim, and in two regional councils and one city. They are the Shar Hanegev Regional mm -hmm. Council, the Eshkol Regional Council, and the city of Sderot. These communities are on the front line with Hamas when Hamas launches mortars, rockets, and explosive balloons and build terror tunnels to infiltrate from under the border to attack the citizens in this area. When a rocket is launched, they only have 15 seconds to reach shelter. With funds raised by our task force, we have built the Eshkol Resiliency Center where people suffering from PTSD go for treatment. The pet therapy center in the city of Starot where children are using animals as part of their treatment for PTSD. And bomb shelter painting to make the bomb shelters more attractive for children with running, who are running for cover. We are now working mm -hmm. on the Play School Kingdom in Eshkol. The facility will offer innovative learning experiences that integrate play with education while developing creative communication and collaboration skills. The center will be used by Eshkol three elementary schools during school hours and will provide after school activities as well. The Play School Kingdom will help ensure that children build healthy life skills and mature into high functioning adults who reach their potential. Activities will include, will, will involve critical thinking, problem solving and decision-making skills as well as encourage responsibility, 
tolerance, entrepreneurship, and curiosity. It's a two-story structure and will house a rock climbing wall, a tree house with play structure, virtual reality rooms, a planetarium, science and robotic spaces, art workshops, and general social and gathering spots. Designated sections of the building will be reinforced to ensure that children are always safe, secure, and near a bomb shelter should it be needed. To date, our task force has raised four and a half million dollars for a period over a period of four years. I'm also involved in the Housing and Development Fund, which facilitates, oh, first let me go into the, the picture that you see in front of you is one of many, many, many balloons tied to explosive devices that are launched from uh, Hamas territory um, almost on a, on a daily basis. And children are, are warned not to go near balloons and to be afraid of balloons because if not, they could be, they could be hurt. So um, that's the, the way, unfortunately, that they have to live in the Gaza border communities. Uh, fearful of balloons, fearful of fires, because some of these uh, balloons uh, carry uh, incendiary devices, which when they land, they cause fires. And if in the middle of the summer, where they get very little rain, everything just burns, uh, crops, wildlife, you name it, it gets, it gets affected. So I'm also involved in the Housing and Development Fund, which facilitates the movement of population to the Negev and the Galilee, an imperative for Israel's security and lasting future by providing targeted funding for physical infrastructure, which is needed to commence the home building process. Unlike the US, there is no private residential development in Israel. All development is controlled by the municipalities. Only after all the lots in a development are purchased and financed can that physical infrastructure be developed, causing delays of two to five years in the start of housing construction. Many communities in the Negev and Galilee wish to expand and there's a high demand for good quality <laughs> housing outside of the congested and expensive center of the country. However, many small communities lack the necessary capital to develop their land for housing. JNF provides loans to these communities and provides the capital necessary for ground infrastructure to be completed. To date, this task force has approved $19 million in loans and 1,338 lots are supported in 29 different communities throughout the country along the borders with Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Egypt. Obviously, we're looking to, as a JNF uh, strategy, to move the population from the population centers to the periphery, and this is how it's done. We don't do things in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Haifa, or all the other areas that are not strategically important for JNF. So, as you can now see, JNF ain't just trees. For more information, go to their website, jnf.org. Okay, I'll stop here to open up for any questions. Yes, Marty. Okay, I can't hear you because you're muted. I'll try to unmute him. Okay. I can, okay, hi, Ariel. First of all, thank you, it's like great going home time. You know, I've been on two of these trips already. I can't wait. I was signed up for a third. I'm waiting maybe to hopefully go again. I can't tell you how much, how nice it was to do all this. Uh, you know, it's just fantastic what uh, Thank you. Did. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a phenomenal experience to go on, on a tour of Israel with, uh, with JNF. They... And uh, one, one other quick thing, which you didn't mention, but I know Sandy went on and I recommend anybody that even if you don't go on a, a tour with them for a week or 10 days, they've got this Wednesday one day trip for 50 bucks. It's fantastic. When we were there with the family, we did that and we saw a lot of these things. So yeah. it's unbelievable some of the things that JNF is doing. Yeah, yeah. It, they're all over the place. It's incredible. <laughs> and I'm all over the place when I go to Israel because it gives me the opportunity to see more than just tourist sites. 
you know, if you've been to Israel more than 10 times, uh, you've seen it all, you know, you want to see something that's more meaningful and more, more life-changing. Uh, I've been to some of the places two or three times, every time it's different. Yes. It's incredible. Yeah, there's, you know, they say the national bird of Israel is the crane. The right. <laughs> are always building. <laughs> Fantastic. Ar Ariel. Yes. Uh, it's Sandy. Um, Hi, Sandy. I was there in 2018. I did the bus tour on that Wednesday from Jerusalem. Oh, right. yes, that's a JNF uh, Wednesday tour. Yes. Right. We did the bullet factory, and the secret of how they hid the bullet factory is very interesting. Yes. They built the laundry, made a lot of noise. No one knew machines were working underground. Exactly. We went to Sedrot, they showed us, and they couldn't do an outdoor playground because it would take too long to get to the bomb shelter. They did an indoor playground. They built the climbing wall. Climbing walls are normally 10 feet. Mm -hmm. They made them eight feet because they timed yeah. how long it would take a kid to get down yeah. once the siren sounded. So and that's why they, they couldn't put a carousel either for that reason, because it takes too long to get off a carousel. Right. No carousel. Right. And yeah. hopefully I'm going back this coming uh, this coming October if this piece, that piece is a vaccine. Yes. Yeah, we're going to hopefully get that very soon. I think that uh, it'll be before the end of the year is going to come out. Actually, it's coming out already. They did. Yeah. Well, they're doing it today, today in the States. Oh, right. Hmm. Yeah. Ariel, I have two questions for you. <laughs> yes, Mike. Alita. <laughs> oh, how are um, you? So good. How are you? So two quick questions. One is, so how do you see yourself engaging the younger sort of generations in the States to get as involved in JNF as, as you are? Well, you know, what's, uh, what's sort of your, how do you see success in that? Well, what, what we've done is we've created a JNF futures, which are, are, um, people up to the age of 40. And most of them are starting from age 25. 25 to 40 is a called a um, JNF Futures. And they have their own board, they have their own meetings, and they also participate in all the task forces and all the, the other uh, activities that we're involved in. Uh, when they go to national conference, they have their own track as well. So they have their own learning and then they, they get together in the evening and they party and they, you know, this is what attracts a lot of young people also, is the ability to enjoy themselves at night, not go to sleep early like the older folks. So this attracts a lot of, a lot of JNF futures to the organization. What's your, they're what's, going to be our future leaders. So what you're saying is your daughter only has nine days to be able to participate in that. Correct. Okay. <laughs> and, and and then um, my second question is, is, you know, there's been some, you know, historic peace agreements with certain countries signed in the past 30 days, 45 days. Yes. You know, is JNF sort of lend its expertise maybe to these countries in terms of, you know, their water conservation, things of that nature, things? I, you know, I don't think that they're getting into these uh, deals with Israel just because of uh, being able to buy weapons from the United States. A lot of it has to do with the technology that Israel can impart to these uh, countries, um, especially Bhutan, who yeah. uh, just recently, uh, I think, announced on Saturday that they were going to have a um, uh, peace treaty with Israel. Uh, Bhutan is a small country uh, between uh, India and um, Nepal, and their population is, it's, the country is twice the size of Israel and has a population of 660,000. And they have no relationship with the United States, the UK, uh, China, but they're making relations with Israel because they need Israel's technology. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that many of these uh, countries that are making, uh, the Arab countries also, that are making uh, deals with Israel uh, are, are going to learn from, from them how to survive and and have a better outlook for their people. I'm sure JNF will lend a hand when it can. Sorry? I'm sure JNF will lend, will lend a hand when it can. Absolutely, we do. Uh, through okay. ACAT, they, we bring in people from all these different countries uh. to learn about uh, arid land uh, conservation and arid land development of food product. 
and they take these back to their homeland in Kenya and Zimbabwe and all these places that we don't even have uh, relations with. They learn from us and they go back home and, uh, and talk about how great uh, country Israel is and, and how they help them to, uh, to have more food on their table. Yeah. Thank you. Ariel, hi, it's Rabbi Resnick. First of all, thank you very much. Um, I think I can say thank you for everybody on here, but thank you uh, for meeting you the first time at a meet and greet to now. Um, you dressed a little more informally that time, but uh, yes. uh, thank you. Uh, so two questions. One, can you talk a little more about, you said Israel supplies Jordan with water. Um, what does that mean? And was it happening even before the treaty was signed? Uh, well, Jordan is, is mostly arid and they don't have sufficient water from rain or other sources. They don't have the, uh, they don't have the water desalination plants that Israel has. Israel has built five of them. And so Israel supplies water under the peace agreement. Israel uh, gives water to Jordan. Uh, they don't supply the entire needs of Jordan. Jordan does supply some of their own water uh, for some areas, but Israel has a, uh, an agreement to supply water to Jordan. Great. I, I can't tell you exactly how many cubic meters of water or, or that, but I, I can tell you that it's, it's substantial. And question number two, a lot of what you've talked about sounds like things that the government should be doing, and some of them the government does do. So can you address the question yes. of Mm -hmm. your relation, JNF's relationships uh, with government, and does that change based on who the prime minister is or the times? Great question. JNF USA has absolutely no relationship uh, with the government. KKL, Karen Kayem at Israel, is a quasi-government entity in Israel, and they uh, are a cousin, shall we say, to JNF USA. Yes, Jay. When we plant trees, JNF KK, KKL does the trees. We don't build, we don't plant trees. KKL does the trees. JNF USA has five full-time employees in Israel who monitor the projects that we spend money, that we raise money for. And they make sure that everything is done per code and per timeline that JNF would like it to be done. So there's no cost overruns and that things get done properly and on time. We are totally separate from KKL, uh, which is, as you said, is, is part government uh, and, and things. And, you know, depending who the government is, they, people could be changed as who represents uh, the, the world body. But JNF USA is the largest of the affiliates around the world of JNF. Uh, some of them, like for example, in, in, in some countries, they call themselves KKL. Uh, and, and some other countries, they call themselves JNF, or Jewish National Fund. We ourselves are called Jewish National Fund USA, because we are totally different and, uh, and raise more That's money than all other uh, JNFs around the world. Yeah. Thanks. Organization. Sure. So all these <clears throat> projects are, are funded by Americans or uh, mainly, mainly Americans because it's a USA organization. So it's from volunteers from around the country who are either major donors or once in a blue moon donors. And, uh, and we have all different levels of giving and, and mm -hmm. you know, that's how things get built. You can, you, I don't want to do a total ad like you, you but you can do a monthly situation. And uh, yes. also there's these virtual uh, tours that are going on that I mentioned that Chuck and Charney and I are going on later on today. And uh, they, that's a fantastic endeavor. And um, also not to sound, I don't want to sound uh, wrong, but you can also arrange in your wills, if you wish, to do some amazing things with JNF. I know I've done that. and. Yeah, yeah, they have all different uh, levels. That's why I say, if you want to know more about JNF, go to their website. Uh, it's it's quite quite interesting and uh, has everything. 
but I can answer any questions on anything you want to know about J and F. I mean, I may not know all the details, but <laughs> you know, any other questions? Yes. John. Hi, Jonathan. No, no, that's Mark. Mark. Yeah, we just want to say okay. hello. We met you, I guess, in Boca Raton or Delray Beach, Mark and Elliot Ava. We met you at the um, at the Japanese. Um, oh, yes, that's we're here through uh, Vicky. Could I, Ari, also, were you with the Las Vegas conference too? Yes. I thought so, because it was a board meeting that we attended at the last day. Yes, yes, yeah, so I go all over right. the place. And, yeah, I, yeah. and I just want to say, you made an interesting comment in the beginning. We give to a lot of Jewish causes, but JNF is my favorite. And the nice thing about them is whatever you give, they're always appreciative. It's not like uh, uh, mm -hmm. other organizations. You sure you can't do more, you shan't do this. Whatever you give, I can't tell you how appreciative they are. And hopefully in pandemics are gone, we can all meet in Florida again for our yearly breakfast. Absolutely. Sounds good. Yeah, JNF is, uh, it, it's not just good at that, that it rewards you, I mean, it thanks you for what you do, but it draws you in to actually physically do things yourself if you're yes. willing to. Uh, many organizations just want your money and leave us alone. And you can't get to see the projects, you don't know what, where the money goes. Uh, you have no idea, but with JNF, you can actually go to Israel and see the project. Yes. This is where my money went. This is fantastic. How many organizations allow you to get so involved that you can actually see everything that they've spent money on? What was the one I went to, Ariel? You remember, I think it's wrote, it's wrote the one right up near the Gaza Strip where they were just built building. I was there the day they dedicated the synagogue. Oh. Um, which one was that? I forgot the name of it. It's not Halutza, is it? Halutza? Yeah, I think it was Halutza, yeah. It has three communities I, built from the ground up. I, I went there and I was just overwhelmed. Yeah, and, Halutza, uh, let me... Give a little background about Halutza. Fantastic. Uh, there's when when Israel controlled the Gaza uh, and 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 had communities there. They were, you know, as part of the deal with uh, with Egypt. We moved. We moved. Uh, we moved uh, all, all three communities out of. Uh, it was Gush Katif, yeah. and they built uh, and the Israeli government. Uh, move them to a place called Halutza, which was called the Halutza Sands, because it was all sand. Yeah. And they were on trailer homes for a while until they could actually start doing anything. Um, and, and so JNF came in and said, look, we want to build this area. Uh, we want to expand the population here. And they've, it's a phenomenal place. Uh, yeah, for they nothing, they have hot houses where they're growing vegetables on sand. They're, they have a they have synagogues, they have recreational activities. Uh, there's a, a religious community, there's a secular community. It's it's all pluralistic in some areas. Anyway, yes, Marty, you were there in 18, and it's interesting, they were building the schools first, the hospital, the synagogue, and they were still living in trailers. And there weren't roads yet. And I actually met, we met people there. It was just an incredible, incredible visit. You don't, you don't get to see any of those things on a regular tour. Never. Yeah. never. And you don't and get to see, you don't get a tour of incredible. Bombs either. Oh, I went into, we, we were there. Actually, really. There's <laughs> now tours, there's now actually tours of the bomb shelter paintings uh, that are done by people. We have the city of Starot, which is right on the, it's half a mile from the border of Gaza. Yeah. The city of Starot uh, has 250 bomb shelters because they have 15 seconds for kids or anyone who's out in the street to get to a bomb shelter before a, a rocket can land. So they get the alert, the red alert, and they have 15 seconds. So we have bomb shelters everywhere outside. And it's an unfortunate this has to be the, the way people live. That's where that big children's and, center and so is. We've now painted them so that, you know, they, they look attractive to kids and they're not scared to go into a bomb shelter. Uh, but but uh, we've, we've uh, had people paint them and they, they look wonderful. Any, any other uh, questions or comments? Yeah, I'll bow. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm Ali Ed. Um, our daughter was in Israel at that time when, Sudo, when they were building those bomb shelters and she was part of the mission to paint them a different color to make them enticing to the children. But what she was struck by that all the, the electrical and the engineering that was done as well for the children to have computers and access to do everything they needed to do to give them some normalcy. Hmm, that's very interesting. I didn't know that they had uh, electrical connections as well. That's very What's interesting. What's daughter's name? Because I did something similar. Uh, Jessica, well, now she's uh, Shanefeld, Jessica Abo, Shanefeld. Did she do it through Leave Note? She did it. Uh... Hi, Dad. Hi, Steph. You know, <laughs> no, was it uh, you? Maybe it was the USY pilgrimage. Because um, I I did um, a mission through Leave Note, and we we maybe. volunteered. To maybe, you know, she went back on several different trips, so it, might, it could have been one of them. I know we couldn't find her, and it was during the bombing, and we didn't realize where she was, and she didn't tell us where she was at the time. It was in Kirat Shmona. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All the yeah, way up in the north. It was, yes. it been. It was all the way north because I remember there was a bomb dropped and I, I contacted my parents and I said, I'm a little nervous. There was just a bomb that was dropped and they said, no, you just, just, you're fine. <laughs> just go. Yeah, right, right. Um, and what is your first name? Stephanie. Stephanie. All right, I'll ask her as well. I'll my maiden name was Grunberg. <laughs> Oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> Funny, I have family Holocaust survivors that were Grunbergs that lived in New York many years ago. Benno Grunberg. Oh. That's your mishpucha. By the time we're over, I'll find you some more relatives. Okay. <laughs> Ariel, I want to know what you did to get your children on as flag waver members of your uh, <clears throat> fan club. That's pretty good. Into all our dance recitals, so this is the least we could do. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I attended all their, their dance recitals. Oops. We just lose the. Uh, you lost the picture, but uh, somehow. What you mean? How did did I lose it? No, I don't know. Side by, you can get to see everything. I'm so viewing somebody else's screen. It says on. Oh, somebody is somebody sharing a screen. I don't know who's doing that. Then. I don't. I didn't do it. I don't know who's doing that. I blame the host. <laughs> <laughs> Who's host? Not me. <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> you know, one thing, Ario, I think you mentioned a little bit up north where they set up these consor consortiums. Is that a consortium? You know, with the different small businesses, yes. everybody it's helping everybody border. out. Yes. Right on the border of uh, Lebanon. It's, it's the upper, it's called the uh, Galilee area. Yeah, yeah, that was an incredible visit there, too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's, I, I've been to the uh, uh, glass blowing factory. You if do? you've done that, it's an amazing- uh, Yeah, I think place. I was there. They actually blow, blow beautiful uh, yeah. uh, glassware and we bought some things there and brought it home. No, actually we didn't, we left it in Israel in our apartment in Tel Aviv. Uh, beautiful, beautiful pieces of glass and, and it had jagged ends on it. And not that you can cut yourself, but it was really very unique. And very interesting and i was told that they sell their their wares to many uh restaurants and hotels and stuff like that for for display in their lobbies and stuff but yeah uh, also yeah. ario i gotta thank you probably for the 40th time you really were responsible for my first trip because remember louise and i were in a rod and i needed some medication yes and ario went to my daughter she went to tover and got it and brought it it was incredible you were on that mission too that was back Oh, quite a number of years ago. Yeah, I and, want to say you know, I've been on at three least four since then. Yeah, I've been on at least ten missions with uh, J and F, along with so many times being on my own. But that's what I like about it because I go to Israel so often. Uh, this way, I can't go visit the same people. I go with J and F. I go to. I have new friends. I have the mayors mm -hmm. of the three different cities. I mm -hmm. have uh, J and F liaison people from the different. Uh, organizations that we support, you know, I, I get to see them and they're like family. And uh, I also, uh, you know, I also work with United Hatsala, which is a, uh, the rescue organization. And I meet up with a volunteer where I donated a motorcycle, an ambucycle. So I have family everywhere around the country. <laughs> yeah, we had a reunion of our last trip on Zoom last December, about uh, 20 of us got together from the trip in uh, 18. Yeah. Yeah. 
Anybody else have any interesting uh, comments or uh, questions on, on any Ariel. presentation? Because I didn't go into a lot of detail. Uh, even though it seems like I did, I really just touched the surface of what we do. Hi, Ariel. Hi, Joel. Joel. Good. More of a personal observation, but when Rebecca was on the screen, and I know Alita's probably in the background there, I swore I was looking at Alita in high school. <laughs> <laughs> here she is. Come here. Come here, Alita. Hi, Alita. Hi, Hi Alita. Hi. I swear, you, uh, you cannot believe how much I looked at her and I said, this is, this is Alita in high school, I swear. Wow. Uh, <laughs> very cool. That's funny. So, uh, oh, I have to, I just want to say that JNF has about 200 projects going at, at, at any given time. And, and there's only five professional JNF people in Israel who actually run the whole show. It's just incredible. Uh, that, and, and the way the, the organization runs is really from lay leaders. Uh, you know, some of the decisions are made by the professionals, but we take it and run with it. So a lot of our, the lay leaders like me do most of the work for the organization. I think it's one of the few organizations that takes advantage of all the donors. <laughs> In the way all right, Ariel, on behalf of Hergic, let me thank you once again for your talk. And to all the people who are here, let me welcome you to the next few talks that we're going to have. Next week, we're gonna have a state senator from Kansas talking about voting rights. The week after, we're gonna have Rebecca Anton Osder from our uh, congregation speaking, and then we'll have lots of other speakers in January, February, and I hope not too much after that point, because we're all going to be able to see each other in person. But once again, Ariel, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, it's really been very inspiring to see how you have made this great connection with the land of Israel and with the people there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. Okay, Chuck, get packing. Yeah. Bye, Jonathan. Okay, good care. Thank you. And everybody else. Thank you, Ariel. Dan? Okay, thank you, Ariel. Thank you, Ariel. Very safe. Vicky. Wow.